for joining me for lecture two. What we're gonna talk about today are ways to minimize your risk factors for dementia throughout the lifespan. You might think of risk factors as just pertaining to older adults, but there's actually things that happen to us even from the time that we're in our mother's bellies that affect us later on in the future and increase our risk of developing dementia. A great place for us to start is to talk about the influence of genes on the likelihood of developing dementia. We're gonna talk about gene variations and gene mutations. Very few dementias are related to genetic mutations alone. In the vast majority of dementias, it's a combination of genes coming together with someone's environment or their lifestyle that activates their predisposition genetically to developing dementia. And that's been a big part of this series. I want you to take control of those risk factors that you can that will minimize your chances of developing dementia. That's been a big part of what we've talked about during our time together, is how is it that we can take control of our brain health and minimize those risk factors for turning on the genetic predisposition to different dementias. Alzheimer's disease provides us with the perfect example for thinking about this. Do you know that there's two types of Alzheimer's disease? There's what we call early onset and late onset. Most of us, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, we think about people in their 80s developing symptoms of memory loss, difficulty with language, and trouble with behavior and mood over a period of time. This is what we call late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease. For many people, there's a large contribution of lifestyle. Early onset Alzheimer's disease, in contrast, is much more genetic. So this is another one of those important rules of thumb. The younger someone is when they began to develop symptoms of dementia, the more likely it is to be genetic. Now, early onset Alzheimer's disease is defined as starting before the age of 60. I've had the unfortunate chance to diagnose someone as young as 38 years old with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And in that case, there was a very strong family history of Alzheimer's. So let's learn a little bit more about our genes. Our genes are made up of DNA and we inherit one set from each of our parents. This is the instructions that our cells use throughout all of our body on how to develop, but also maintain our health over time. Our genes and the environment combine together to increase our risks of many age-related diseases, including dementia. Let's talk about the two different kinds of genes that are relevant when we're talking about dementia. These are genetic mutations and genetic variations. Genetic mutations are faulty genes, and they're actually pretty rare. The effects of these mutations is typically pretty harmful to the individual, and these people tend to show the symptoms earlier on in their development. People with genetic mutations that are related to dementia will develop the dementia no matter what they do in their lifetime. Very few cases of dementia, however, are related to genetic mutations alone. In contrast, we have genetic variants, and that's what most of us need to be concerned about. That's that unique combination of a genetic predisposition and something happening in our environment through behavior and lifestyle choices that turns on that gene. So why is it that we're talking about the whole lifespan today? That's because most dementias are the result of decades and decades of processes happening in the body and the brain that eventually develop into dementia. So the first phase of development that we're gonna talk about is in utero and childhood. Maternal smoking and low birth weight has been associated with the development of dementia later in life. More specifically, babies that were born under six pounds, two ounces, are more likely to have cognitive impairment in middle age. Now, of course, the risks of low birth weight are not unique to dementia. There's many other physical conditions that are also associated with low birth weight, but I don't think that most of us typically put dementia into that category. Poor school performance in childhood and middle school has also been associated with an increased risk of dementia. I want you to take a look at some of the research on this slide. Two 2015 studies showed an association between childhood school performance at the ages of nine and 10 and the development of dementia later in life. 
Dementia risk was elevated 21% in people who were in the lowest tier of childhood school grades, and this was the case for more than 50% in those over the age of 75. Individuals who completed secondary education had a 28% lower risk of dementia when compared with individuals who only had an elementary school education. Some learning disabilities are also associated with the development of certain dementias, specifically frontotemporal dementias, like primary progressive aphasia. That's a type of dementia where language is very specifically affected. What I want you to know about these studies is that they're what brain scientists call correlational studies. They don't really tell us about cause and effect. All they're telling us is that there is some type of relationship between those two variables, let's say school performance and dementia. But you also have to use your imagination and your critical thinking cap and think about other things that could be unique to these people that may also be raising their risk, but we just didn't measure in the research study. For example, Kids that don't do great in school might not necessarily have the best nutrition. Maybe there was a lot of stress in the home. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's an accurate reflection of their intellectual abilities by any means. But I do want you to think back to that concept of cognitive reserve. We keep going back to this time and time again. This was Dr. Stern's idea is that the more enriched our environments are, especially our earliest experience, like elementary school, middle school, and college, the more enriched those environments are, the stronger our brain networks are, and the more and more disease it takes for us to show symptoms. Remember that study on the autopsies of individuals who had Alzheimer's disease by clinical definition in their brain, but they didn't show the symptoms in everyday life. Okay, I want you to take a look at this slide. We're gonna talk about low physical activity and TV viewing in childhood as a risk factor for dementia. In 2016, researchers investigated the effects of low levels of physical education and high TV viewing in children in their middle childhood years. And what they found after following them to midlife is that they were almost two times more likely to have poor cognitive functioning. Now this was after taking away the effects of things like smoking, alcohol, and high blood pressure. So let's understand that study a little bit more. How did they define low physical activity? They decided that what this meant was that these children were getting less than 50 minutes of exercise three times per week. And how they defined high TV viewing was more than four hours per day. So let's transition now into adulthood and start to look at things that are unique to the young and mid years. The first thing is cardiovascular health. Remember that heart health and brain health are virtually interchangeable. The strongest risk factors in midlife for Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, which is the kind of dementia associated with strokes, are all related to cardiovascular health high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and high cholesterol. The effect of all of these medical conditions is that they narrow the blood vessels, making it harder for blood to flow to different parts of our body. This is especially true for the teeny tiny blood vessels in our brain. Each heartbeat pumps between 20 and 25% of the blood in the body directly to the brain. Blood carries the brain's essential fuels, oxygen and glucose. Without steady supplies of these two fuels, our brain cannot function properly. In lecture three, the next one coming up in the series, you're gonna learn all about vascular health. But what I want you to know for now is that these risk factors are the most strongly related to the future development of dementia. If you are in middle age or someone you know is in their middle years, you really wanna encourage them not to develop these medical conditions at all. Once we've had them, even if we take our medications as good as we possibly can, in many cases, the damage is done. This is particularly true for those small blood vessels in the brain that aren't able to get any support from adjacent blood vessels. We just discussed the negative effects of physical inactivity in childhood. Well, this is a risk factor that follows us even into our adulthood. One researcher in 2005 asked participants how often that they were participating in physical activity that lasted 20 to 30 minutes and caused sweating and breathlessness. 
Individuals who did this at least twice a week had a 50% less chance of developing dementia when compared with more sedentary people. This association was even stronger for people who had a family history of dementia, particularly those who carry the APOE4 gene variation. An unhealthy diet in middle age is associated with the increase of dementia, particularly a diet high in saturated animal fats. As we know, this increases cholesterol. Folks who eat too much salt in middle age have also been shown to have increased risk of all those cardiovascular risk factors that you now know narrow the blood vessels that enter the brain, thereby starving the brain of its main fuel it needs to survive and operate well. I know that you've been inundated with recommendations about how to change your diet for brain health. The truth is we have a lot more to learn as brain scientists about the foods that we eat and how it affects the brain. But I think it's common sense to assume that this is a very relevant and important topic for future research. In a future lecture, we're gonna talk all about how different substances affect the body and the brain, particularly in aging folks. And one of the things we're gonna really focus on is diet. There is only one diet out there that has a strong evidence base for having an effect on the later development of dementia. This is called the MIND diet the Mediterranean Intervention for Degenerative Delay. You're gonna learn all about it in the future. Some researchers have focused on the quality of oral hygiene as a risk factor for dementia, specifically gum disease. More specifically, a study in 2012 looked at middle-aged adults who had lost a tooth before the age of 35. And what they found is that these people had a four-fold increase in their risk of developing dementia in later life. Gum disease is essentially an inflammatory process that makes the gums really sensitive and easy to bleed. Most inflammatory processes in the body are systemic, which means they don't just happen in one part of the body. As you know from some of our other lectures, inflammation is one of the number one risk factors for cognitive impairment as we age. Another risk factor in midlife is education and job complexity. This effect is most strongly seen in individuals who have a low number of formal years of education. But we don't want to make the mistake of assuming that just because someone has a low level of education, that they're not well educated. I'm sure plenty of you know, as I do, that there's extremely smart people who know how to do all sorts of things that you don't necessarily learn in school. Researchers have looked at the different types of jobs that people had, and what they found is that people who worked more with people had a much better chance at not developing dementia as they got older, when compared with people whose jobs was primarily focused on things like data and computers. What we know is that people are complicated. When we interact with people, we're having to use our brains in a very flexible way. We have to augment what we're saying based on their responses. We have to hold back sometimes in saying things that we would really like to say. There's a lot of conflict resolution that happens in interpersonal relationships. So these studies are giving us a really good insight into the fact that when we interact with people, our brains get stronger. This again is giving more power to the idea that social health is critical for brain health. Middle-aged individuals who engage in activities with a high level of mental stimulation have been shown time and time again to be less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease as they get older. You might have heard about the NUN study that came out a couple years ago, and this was a really interesting research project that analyzed the letters of a series of nuns and the likelihood of them going on to develop Alzheimer's disease. What they found is that the more complex these letters were, the bigger the vocabulary the more complex the ideas, the more they wrote about mentally stimulating activities, the less likely those nuns were to go on to develop dementia. Any shift work or night work modestly increases our risk of developing dementia. And researchers think that this is due to a disruption of the circadian rhythm in the brain. And what happens is the body's aging process and the brain's aging process gets accelerated and people experience a more rapid process of aging. In a series of mouse studies, researchers found that sleep deprivation in particular 
really increase the amount of beta amyloid, one of the primary causes of Alzheimer's disease, in the brains of these mice. One thing that can happen when people work third shift is that they're not getting enough long, uninterrupted hours of sleep. As we've talked about in other lectures, you now know that this is essential for all aspects of health. In middle age, too much alcohol can be a real problem down the road. Researchers have found that drinking more than three drinks per day for a period of about 20 years is pretty bad for the brain. This is about how much the brain can handle before we start to see brain damage associated with alcohol. Think about when people have a little bit too much to drink. Think of those behaviors. People can get a little bit wobbly, they lose their balance, they have a hard time remembering what happened the next day, they can also get a little bit mouthy. This is because the cells in a part of our brain called the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells, are particularly vulnerable to the effects of alcohol. After about 20 years, you start to see damage in these cells. And what you can find is that older adults who have a history of alcohol use, like we said, about three drinks a day for more than 20 years, start to show some of these symptoms even when they're not intoxicated. Like most findings in science, the answers aren't straightforward. And there has been a body of literature suggesting that there are protective effects of a mild to even moderate amount of alcohol. And what we think this is mediated by is the positive effects that alcohol have on the vascular system, opening up those blood vessels and letting more blood flow through to all areas of the body, including the brain. So now let's transition to thinking about risk factors that are unique to older adulthood. And what I mean by this is people over the age of 65. As we know, age presents the biggest risk factor for the development of dementia. But remember, it's not an inevitable part of aging. Our risk of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia doubles every five years after the age of 65. And why is this? Some of it is genetic and just related to the way that DNA changes over time, but a lot of it has to do with those modifiable risk factors that we keep talking about, specifically cardiovascular health. There's also a weakening of the body's immune system that can happen over time, and changes in hormones are surely a part of the puzzle, but the truth is research in that area is very young, specifically for postmenopausal women. The truth is we just don't have the scientific knowledge at this time to really understand how changes in hormones affect the brain and more specifically affect memory. People over the age of 65 who take more than five medications a day are at risk for something called polypharmacy. And we get worried about these folks because of the unintended interactions that can happen between multiple medications. This is relevant to folks over 65 because as we get older, as you all know, we are prescribed more and more medications. The average 65-year-old person is prescribed between 11 and 17 new prescriptions per year. Now what's interesting about that statistic is not all of those prescriptions are filled. And some social scientists think that this is due to the fact that older adults feel strongly that they don't want to be taking so many medications. You have to take this part, though, with a grain of salt. And I always want to remind you that you cannot start or stop taking medications just as a result of the advice that I'm giving to you in this brain health series. It's very important that you talk with your medical providers, best your primary care physician, before you make any changes yourself. The number of medications that adults over 65 take that have an anticholinergic property is very relevant for this discussion. Most commonly, these medications are used for things like urinary incontinence, sleeplessness, and anxiety, three things that happen to increase as we get older. So let me teach you a little bit about the mechanism of this change, exactly what is it that's happening in the brain that make these medications so concerning. What these medications are doing is that they're dramatically decreasing the amount of a chemical messenger in the brain and the body of older adults called acetylcholine. This is an essential chemical that is a building block of learning and memory. The amount of time that somebody has been on one or more of these medications is really important to this discussion. What the scientific evidence tells us is that after about seven years, people taking these medications were four times more likely to develop dementia. 
Specifically, they had less brain matter, especially in the memory centers of their brain. What we know about anticholinergic medications is that they have a cumulative effect, and the more someone takes, the more damage that it's going to do. I want you to take a moment to look in the workbook and see something I've put in there for you called the anticholinergic burden scale. This is a great resource for you to specifically figure out what your burden score is. You can figure out exactly what your personal risk is due to these medications in your body. The risk for cognitive impairment was increased by 50% in adults who were taking at least three mild versions of an anticholinergic medication for more than 90 days, and by 100% in those receiving one or more of the stronger or more severe type of anticholinergic medications for more than 60 days. Older adults who use a type of medication called benzodiazepines are at increased risk for dementia. Now this has been somewhat controversial in the literature over the last few years, but recently a few studies came out that were of very good quality that suggest it's at least something that we should be very concerned about. These medications are typically used to treat things like sleep and anxiety. You might have heard of them by the name of clonopin, Valium, Xanax, it's those medications. It's been well established for a long time that just one dose does have immediate negative effects on memory and balance. That alone makes us concerned about older adults using these medications. What was unclear for a long time is that if long-term use increase the risk of cognitive impairment in this group. Recent research does suggest that there is an increased risk with cumulative use over time. So much so that the American Geriatric Society recently put out a recommendation to not use benzodiazepines or other sedative hypnotics in older adults as the first choice of medication for things like insomnia agitation, or delirium. Now, some use of these medications might be necessary. And again, like most things that we understand from the scientific vantage point, the answers aren't clear. It's not black or white. Every individual is unique. So for you or someone you care about, you need to talk to a medical provider about what is going to work best in your unique situation. If we just use the example of insomnia, it's not as easy as we don't want to give someone a medication to help with sleep because we're worried about the anticholinergic effects. What we know about the effects of sleep deprivation and insomnia is that there are also known cognitive and physical effects that go along with not sleeping for long periods of time. So it's not straightforward and you really need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Older adults who report feeling lonely rather than simply being alone are at much higher risk for developing dementia. Part of the reason we think this is true is because of that rich stimulation that being with other people allows us to have. A study that came out in 2017 looked at older adults' self-report of how lonely they felt. And what they found are the people that reported feeling the most lonely over the course of 12 years had 20% more cognitive impairment. This next risk factor that we're gonna talk about is really, really important for older adults, and I really want you to listen closely to this. It's about the topic of delirium. Sometimes it goes by other names like hospital-based confusion, acute mental status change, older adult psychosis, but really the technical name is delirium. And yes, it does tend to happen most commonly in a medical setting like a hospital. I wanna teach you a little bit about this important condition because it's essential that you do everything you can to keep you or someone you love from developing this condition. Delirium is a syndrome that happens in older adults in the face of some kind of infection in the body most commonly, or after someone has started a new medication, abruptly stopped a medication, or undergone general anesthesia. It's made up of a group of symptoms that you need to know about. The first one is sudden and acute mental status changes. What we mean by that is someone who is suddenly confused, doesn't know where they are, can't remember who people who are familiar to them are. This has to be a dramatic departure from their normal ways of functioning. The next symptom is sleep-wake disturbance. And what this means is that someone's sleep cycle gets all fouled up. They're sleeping during the day, they're awake all night, there's just no rhyme or reason to their sleeping patterns. 
The third symptom is agitation. We're not just talking about low level irritability here. We're talking about agitation that's to the point of needing chemical or physical restraints in some instances. And the final symptom is seeing and hearing things that aren't there or delusions. And again, we're not just talking about a little bit of paranoia here. We're talking about some really wild, stressful, threatening experiences that feel incredibly real to the person who's going through it. I've heard all sorts of stories ranging from pirates brought me here to this isn't my husband, somebody has kidnapped me, I'm a mannequin in a mall and they won't let me free. These are really, really dramatic tales that feel incredibly intense and real to the person going through them. There's two primary concerns with delirium when it comes to older adults. Just one episode of delirium increases the future risk of Alzheimer's disease by about eight times. There's no medications that can directly treat delirium. What we need to do is treat the underlying cause that is making the delirium be there in the first place. And that's why it's so important that we recognize symptoms of delirium and don't just brush them off as an older adult being confused because of age, or maybe it's because they've had an underlying dementia. It is true that any cognitive impairment prior to an episode of delirium delirium puts that person at dramatically increased risk. So this includes anything more than just normal age-related changes, particularly people who have the very earliest stages of dementia. When they get into the hospital and either have an infection or go through a big surgery, they are very, very likely to get delirium. Even though we think of delirium as something that is transient and that people should recover from once the underlying issue has been treated, that's not the case for people with dementia. What can happen is that they can take a very big step down from their normal levels of functioning and never really get back up to the same level that they were before. This is particularly the case when people go through multiple bouts of delirium. One of the ways that you can minimize this risk factor is to try to keep yourself or someone you love out of the hospital to the degree possible. Now this has to do with things like fall prevention, making sure someone isn't overtaking their medications. Again, it's very important to go to the hospital if you do have a true emergency and you need that level of care. But we can also do several things that will prevent the likelihood of unnecessary hospital trips. Hearing loss presents a unique risk factor for older adults for the development of dementia. Hearing loss is very common as we get older, and we used to think that it was just a nuisance and it was frustrating, and it certainly is both of those things, but it also presents a unique risk factor for the development of dementia. The idea is that the cells in the auditory comprehension cortex of the brain, if they're not hearing sounds, they're not getting stimulated, and they don't see any reason to stick around. Once the process of cell death has started in the brain, sometimes it can become more and more progressive and initiating the start of a dementia that wouldn't otherwise have started. Untreated hearing loss is the perfect example of one of those interactions that we've been talking about between genes and the environment. Untreated hearing loss is one of those modifiable risk factors that you or someone you love can absolutely do something about. And if you don't do something about it, what scientists know is that it's going to result in an increased risk of cognitive impairment, including dementia. The idea is if the cells in the brain and the auditory cortex aren't being stimulated, they don't think that they have a job to do and they're not gonna hang around. Once the process of cell death has started in the brain, that can happen more and more, which we know is at the heart of the dementias. MRI studies have showed us that older adults with hearing loss that's untreated have less gray matter in their brain than those who have hearing loss that's treated. Another important risk factor that not hearing well presents to the brain is the social isolation that comes along with not hearing well. People that don't hear well tend to isolate themselves. It's very frustrating to be at a dinner party, just as an example, and not be able to hear what's going on. The next thing that can happen is that people with untreated hearing loss wind up not engaging with other people as frequently. And you've already learned that that rich interaction back and forth between people is very stimulating for the brain. 
The last risk factor for older adulthood that I want to talk to you about is our sleeping patterns. A study came out in 2017 that we call the SALT study, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. What they found is that different aspects of our sleep behavior predicted dementia in the future, specifically short and extended time in bed. This was under six hours and over nine hours. These people were much more likely in about 17 years to go on to meet criteria for dementia. Researchers concluded that these data suggest that extended time in bed and late rising represent very early features of dementia, whereas under six hours in bed appeared to be a risk factor for dementia. Now we're gonna to transition to the I Care For Your Brain recommendations as it relates to this information that we've just learned. The number one thing is that you need to take control of your health. I hope that you listen to all this information with an ear on how it relates to you and the people that you care about. Only you can know your personal risk factors for dementia. As it relates to medications, one thing that I want you to do is demand a medication review once a year with your primary care physician. And I want you to ask them to pay special close attention to those medications that we talked about called the anticholinergic medications. They do pose a unique risk factor for dementia and many older adults are completely unaware. What you're going to do is use the workbook to figure out your specific anticholinergic burden scale and you're going to bring this information to your doctor with the goal of getting your score down to as low as it can safely be with the help of your doctor, of course. Remember a little while ago we talked about how important mental stimulation was in midlife? What you need to do as a result of knowing that is to engage in more and more complex activities and hobbies. Now, what I want you to do is find things that are personally important to you and unique to your own background. The best thing that you can do in terms of mental activity is to find something that you've known for a pretty long time and build on your body of knowledge. Take something that maybe you know a little bit about and really get into it. Become an expert in your own unique way, learning everything that you can about that subject. Now, I wanna just give you a little bit of a warning though, because we want you to stick with it. I don't want this to be an idea that you get interested in today, but don't follow through with tomorrow. What we know is that it has to be something that you actually enjoy. If people all around you are playing golf, but this doesn't really interest you, chances are you're not gonna stick with it. Now golf, as an example, does have physical benefits, but of course there's a large cognitive component to golf as well. It's a very visuospatial hobby. There's a lot of mental mathematics that have to happen, a lot of spatial reasoning to get that little ball from the tee into the hole. Golf absolutely offers a very strong cognitive activity. You have to find things that really are appealing to you. If you're a puzzle person, fantastic. Start off doing a puzzle, but don't keep the pieces at the same level over time. You want to slowly and slowly introduce more complexity and more difficulty into the task. We all need to be moving our bodies more. Time and time again, brain scientists tell us that more physical activity and improved cardiovascular health is really the basis of brain health. And again, you have to find something that appeals to you. Every physical activity isn't for everyone. It has to be something that you personally find enjoyable or satisfying. And what I want you to do is try to just engage in that behavior more and more over time. And again, using that principle of neuroplasticity, the scientific foundation that tells us how new brain cells grow and make better connections, you want to make it more and more novel. So you want to add in different elements over time. That's also going to keep you more interested in it. After six months of moderate exercise, brain scans tell us that these people have larger memory centers in the brain. What you want to do though is starting today is just add in a little bit more of physical activity. A little bit every day really adds up. I promise you that you're going to feel better physically, you're going to think more clearly, you're going to be able to focus better, and you'll definitely get a better night's sleep. Let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, alcohol. 
A good rule of thumb is that you want to keep it to about one to two drinks per day. Now, it's very critical to talk about glass size when we're talking about alcohol, because I've made this mistake before in my practice where I'll ask someone, how much is it that you typically drink in a day? And they'll say, oh, don't worry, doctor, I just drink one time per day. Well, sure enough, they then tell me they've been drinking out of a tumbler in 2016, dietary guidelines were put out for older adults that suggested women over the age of 65 should drink about one three to four ounce drink per day. And for men, the top limit should be two. If you look inside your workbook, you're gonna find a behavior tracking sheet for alcohol. This is something that we learn when we study psychology. The best way to change behavior is to just start paying attention to what it is you're doing now. Alcohol is one of those things that's kind of hard to keep track of, so it can be really useful to see it in black and white. Keep it right there in your workbook so when you do try to make changes to cut back to that one or two drinks per day, you can really see the change in what you've done. That way when you make the change to going down to one or two drinks per day, you can really see your behavior change. This is gonna reinforce you to keep making other behaviors to see that you have the power to make a true difference in your health. So now I know the question on everybody's mind is, well, what constitutes one to two drinks per day? So I want you to look at the slide that I have up here and you can get a really good sense of exactly what it is I'm talking about according to different types of alcohol, from beer to wine to hard liquor. Many brain scientists think that our diet affords us one of the greatest opportunities for reducing the chance that we might get dementia as we get older. The MIND diet has the greatest scientific proof behind it for truly doing that. Again, when we get to our substances lecture, I'm gonna teach you all about the best diet and what you should be eating to reduce your chance of cognitive impairment. But what I wanna talk about now is the dietary prevention program set forward for Alzheimer's disease in 2013. They encourage us to minimize our intake of trans fats and saturated fats. They suggest that the majority of our diet is plant-based. These guidelines want us to get vitamin E and vitamin B12, which are both essential for brain health from our diet and fortified foods rather than supplements and vitamins. They recommend a multivitamin every day that doesn't have iron or copper in it. The next recommendation is to be a social butterfly in your own way. Every year, more and more research articles are published showing the value and the benefit of staying socially active. As we rely more and more on things like our iPads and smartphones to communicate, one thing that we can forget is that nothing can replace face-to-face -face interaction. If you care about someone who's over the age of 65, I wanna encourage you to make an effort to visit with them face-to-face. Even if you can do FaceTime on your phone, that's gonna go a longer way than just talking with people on the phone. In your community, I think that there's many opportunities for you to go out and to be with people. You don't have to do it by anyone else's playbook. You get to decide for you what makes you feel socially fulfilled. For some people, it's going to a concert. For other people, it's going to an interesting lecture with their friends. For other people, it's lunch with their best friend. Whatever works for you, you have to spend some time every day with other people. If you care about someone that you think might be socially isolated, you might wanna just ask them if they feel lonely. Research tells us that that's really the key critical concept here. It's not necessarily being alone, it's when people feel that they are all alone. Remember before when I talked about delirium? Well, it's commonly thought of as a mental condition that happens in a medical context. And it's true that the further and further you get into the medical world, the more likely you are to develop delirium, with the hospital and the intensive care unit having the highest level of incidence. So what you wanna try to do as safely as you can is stay out of the hospital. Many older adults take trips into the emergency room every year for things that can be prevented, specifically things like falls. You wanna look around the house and make sure that there's no small area rugs on the floor that would be easy 
easy to trip over. If your doctor's told you or a loved one that you really need to be using a cane or walker, I really want you to take that advice seriously. There's so many things that we can do preventatively that really will save you so much time and heartache down the road. Remember with delirium, the more and more times a person has that, the more unlikely they are to come back to their cognitive baseline. Remember that the hospital can also save your life, so please don't not go if you need to. And the last recommendation that I have for you today is the critical importance of the early and accurate diagnosis of memory symptoms, specifically dementia. Dementias are all progressive, unfortunately. What this means is symptoms of dementia do get worse and worse over time, but the earlier and more accurate of a diagnosis that someone gets for their specific type of dementia, I guarantee you that that person will have a higher quality of life. Remember that the memory medications that are on the market today really need to be given as early as possible to be the most effective. The earlier a person starts to take them, the better chance we have at keeping that person at that level of functioning for the longest period of time possible. And remember, the type of doctor that is in the best position to help you with memory concerns, including dementia, is a neuropsychologist. Thank you so much for joining me today. I can't wait to see you at the next lecture.